Between the Civil War and World War II, uh, African Americans all over are trying to figure out, how do I change my circumstances? How do I make it so that I am not uh, living in fear for my life? I have economic freedom. I have political freedom. How do I better my circumstances? And, and there are different lines of thinking. We had some folk like Booker T. Washington, and he was born into slavery. Um, he said, we have to build as a community of African Americans basic skills so that uh, we could become respectable uh, to white society. Uh, you could imagine uh, white folks, especially in the U.S. South, really like this message. It asked them to change nothing, basically. Uh, just let us train ourselves in basic skills so that we gain uh, respectability. Then you had um, more progressive or radical thinkers um, like W.E.B. Du Bois, who was the founder of the NAACP. The NAACP was actually founded in the Henry Street Settlement House, uh, discussed in the episode on Jewish immigration, and Lillian Wald, uh, who ran the Henry Street Settlement House, uh, was a founding member. And so Du Bois' big demand was, you know, we want equality and we want it now. We don't want to wait. Uh, we don't want to build up basic skills in the ways uh, that uh, Booker T. Washington is describing. We want equality and we want it now. Um, and one of the ways that he thought they could achieve this is by encouraging blacks to join uh, in the effort uh, during World War I. Thinkers like W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, they, they pushed for black entrance into the war effort because they thought this was a step towards uh, equality, towards inclusion in the American system. Uh, du Bois would go on to teach at the New School in New York. Um, he, he eventually moved away from his integrationist strategy, thinking there's no way that we can achieve equality by uh, asking white folks to treat us as equals. Um, he would uh, move to Ghana, uh, where he died um, in the 1960s. The third thing I want to chat with you guys about is Marcus Garvey. Now, Marcus Garvey was born in Jamaica, uh, but he immigrated to the United States in the 19-teens, and he became a leader in um, what would sort of develop as a, a, a movement for black nationalism. He wanted black folks to be in control of their own businesses. Um, he wanted black folks to have their own political rights and political authority. He famously said, some Negro leaders have advanced the belief that in another few years, the white people will make up their minds to assimilate their black populations. This belief is preposterous, right? He had a lot of evidence that suggested this was a preposterous idea. He said black folks need to take control of their own communities. Um, he started the Back to Africa movement, uh, which was an idea that we could create sort of a black utopia in Africa. The race can only be saved through a solid industrial foundation. The race can only be saved through political independence. Take away industry from a race, take away political freedom from a race, and you have a group of slaves. So he wanted black folks to control their own community, to, to control businesses, to control their own governments. And he didn't know if there was a future where that was possible in the United States. In 1917, he organized the Universal Negro Improvement Association in Harlem so that black investors could um, help build up the black community there. Uh, a major component of this was the Black Star Line, which was a shipping company that was supposed to sort of transport African Americans and black folks in the Western Hemisphere back to Africa. So Garvey set up these UNIA um, stations all over the United States, all over the Caribbean. This isn't just the United States, it's all over the Western Hemisphere. There were some in Europe as well. Um, he created sort of a black defense program. Uh, as you can imagine, white authority figures freaked out because Garvey was demanding things from white society that they were certainly not willing to give up. And a young man named Hoover gets his name by hunting Garvey and looking for ways to get Garvey in trouble and get him out of the country, get him to stop asking African Americans to rise up and take control of their own institutions. Um, the foundation of the FBI actually is tied a lot to 
an effort by the U.S. government to stop Garvey and to stop the political radicals of the 19-teens. Finally, they're successful in uh, getting Garvey arrested. He would serve about a year in prison before being deported in 1927. But his ideas about black nationalism, about what would later be termed black power, uh, they would continue to live on and really thrive in Harlem. Figures like Garvey saw Harlem as the place to operate. This was increasingly becoming the center of black culture in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I mean, you have an emergence of black artists and musicians who are all moving from the South to escape the terrorism of the South, and they are bringing their different cultural forms, their different ways of dance, their different ways of making music, their different ways of writing and speaking and thinking, and they're all coming together in Harlem. You had people of African descent uh, from all over the world as well. It wasn't just the U.S. South. You had people coming from uh, Puerto Rico, including Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, who uh, would become a major black thinker, and the West Indies, like Marcus Garvey. And they were all coming and just sharing different versions of black culture throughout the Western Hemisphere. And having these black folks from all over the nation and all over the world coming together it allows for so many new ideas and, and so many new cultural forms to develop. And this is what will become the Harlem Renaissance. That didn't mean that things were just wonderful in Harlem. A lot of Harlem was still segregated. 125th Street was almost exclusively white-owned. Much of it was segregated. It didn't allow black folks to work there. In places like the Cotton Club, which was in Harlem, uh, it was black performers, black wait staff, and exclusively white audience. For a long time, it was segregated. Um, you had the Hotel Teresa, which uh, was built as a segregated hotel and would remain so for decades into the 20th century. So even though you have this community that is increasingly black, um, given the work of Philip Payton and others to, to open up Harlem to black migration, uh, it, it's still a divided neighborhood. You had Italian Harlem, which is now Spanish Harlem, and, and you had um, different immigrant groups, different white groups, Irish, Jews, Italians, Germans who, who were living there and owned a lot of the major businesses. Zora Neale Hurston she was born um, in Alabama, but she grew up in a place called Eatonville, Florida. And um, Eatonville, Florida was significant because it was one of the first all-black incorporated towns in the United States. Uh, and so what that means is she grew up in a, in a setting until she was 13 years old where there was no jail in the town. Black folks had political, economic, and cultural capital. And it instilled in her uh, sort of a, a sense of black pride that uh, would be revealed later on in her work. Uh, she moved to New York City in 1925. She got her bachelor's degree from Barnard. And in Harlem, she fell into the literary scene. You had Langston Hughes there. The two became very close. Uh, they developed a plan to start producing plays that were black written and uh, black run. Um, and, and that would not fall into the stereotypes that dominated blacks in films um, and in plays at that time. Um, but rather show black people as complex, capable characters. And uh, this was different and unique for the time. She had many successful plays. She went on to write very successful novels. Um, but like so many during the Great Depression, uh, she fell into hard times and uh, she would end up dying uh, without much to her name in 1960. Her legacy, however, is revived by later writers who drew inspiration from Hurston. Um, she's celebrated internationally now, and so despite the obscurity in which she died, um, her voice has been elevated by future generations. So in 1929, very famously, uh, the stock market collapses. This will be the beginning of what will become known as the Great Depression. Uh, it would last until really World War II uh, throughout the 1920s, 30s, and into the 1940s. Um, the Great Depression was terrible for the whole country. Uh, perhaps a third of people were out of work. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, this hit black folks particularly hard. Uh, the black 
people were generally the first people to be fired from jobs, from factories. Um, black people oftentimes were segregated from, from soup kitchens and, and bread lines uh, and not allowed to collect on that. Um, in the South, they were uh, discriminated against, uh, leading to another wave of immigration to the North because um, some of the help policies that were passed during the Roosevelt administration weren't applicable to black sharecroppers. Um, this depression, it, it hits New York particularly hard and it turns Harlem into a slum. Um, there was mass evictions, uh, disease was rampant, uh, there was not a lot of money for public health stuff, um, and all of the actions being taken by the government, um, they often reached white audiences first. Black people were further down the ladder in terms of who's going to be getting government aid during this time of crisis. And so what do you do in times of crisis? People um, turn to inspirational figures. That was certainly one avenue. Uh, there was a man named Father Divine who became extremely popular in Harlem during this time. Uh, he was a preacher. He eventually moved to Brooklyn and then Long Island. He was the first black property owner in the town. Um, again, uh, similar to the Philip Payton story, uh, he was able to secure the property because two neighbors were arguing and one neighbor wanted to punish the other neighbor by selling to a black resident decreasing property value. He was accused of disturbing the peace. Uh, it seems like white residents were mostly just upset uh, about a black person being moved into the neighborhood. Um, after a short prison term, however, he moved to Harlem and uh, he started a fairly integrated movement uh, that spread throughout the country. Um, and it was accused of heresy by other Christian groups, but uh, it was very important for him to sort of create institutions where black people could support themselves. In Harlem, his congregation was majority black. He made sure that uh, black folks had access to sort of self-help um, financing, right, and, and group economics. And um, he wanted to make sure that black people had access to hotels, restaurants, clothing shops, etc. And, and so he pumped money into those uh, industries, making sure that they could be black owned. Um, during the 1930s, he kind of fell in with the Communist Party, not because he was a communist. Uh, he was actually uh, very pro-capitalism, uh, but because uh, of their commitment to civil rights. Uh, and um, and during the 1930s, during this era of great despair where uh, black folks are particularly haunted by the realities of the Great Depression, uh, an ideology uh, that, that believes in equity uh, is pretty appealing to folks. Uh, the, the, the treatment that communists gave African Americans versus uh, mainstream capitalist society uh, in the United States um, proved pretty inviting. Paul Robeson was an American superstar uh, until his politics, his demands for the liberation of his people, uh, of black people, no longer became something white society was willing to accept. Um, he was born in Princeton, New Jersey. He was the son of a freed slave. Um, he ended up being extraordinarily impressive in a number of fields. He was an all-American football player playing at Rutgers University. Uh, he also was the valedictorian of his class at Rutgers. Uh, he moved to New York City after college and attended law school at Columbia University before quitting um, after he had been trained as a lawyer because uh, of the racism that was so inherent to the profession. Uh, his older brother actually was in New York City before him uh, as the reverend of the, the oldest black congregation in New York State, the AME Zion Church, which moved to Harlem in the 1920s. Paul Robeson, he became a major theater star in New York after leaving the legal profession, and he would eventually, you know, become such a big star, um, both in the movies and on the stage, um, that he would be invited to Europe, and he would take part in major, major productions in Europe. Um, he wanted more complicated roles than often he was offered in the United States. Um, 
white directors often typecast black actors to being uh, the barbarian or being, you know, intellectually limited. And Robeson wasn't about that. You know, he was valedictorian. He graduated from Columbia Law School. Uh, he wanted more complexity in his roles. He wanted to use his position as a black actor to uplift the black community. And so he went to Europe and he found opportunities in that, uh, whether he was working on movies involving labor disputes um, or, uh, you know, just raising the prominence of um, black voices uh, internationally. And so he fell in sort of with a more radical progressive crowd um, from these experiences and seeing that more progressive ideologies oftentimes led to more racial inclusion. Um, he became sympathetic with uh, the Soviet Union because uh, their stance on racism in the United States was um, much more sympathetic with black Americans than he ever found in the United States. Following the end of World War II, during the Paris Peace Conference, he, he famously said, we in America do not forget uh, that it was on the backs of white workers from Europe and on the backs of millions of blacks that the wealth of America was built. And we are resolved to share it equally. Um, a lot of rich white people heard this and they were not happy. A lot of middle class white people heard this and they were not happy. They wanted to imagine uh, America is being built by white folks for white folks and, and that's what justifies white supremacy. He was silenced because of his political stances, his uh, desire to, um, to talk about the racial injustice in the United States and, and to talk about the economic injustice faced by black folks in the United States. And he got blacklisted, meaning that he wasn't allowed to participate in uh, his, his job. Uh, he had his passport taken away um, for 10 years. Um, and he eventually would remove himself from public life. He would die in Philadelphia in the 1970s, kind of removed from uh, the public figure that he once was. So like Robeson, uh, many blacks in Harlem, uh, they are responding to the conditions that they're witnessing, right? Especially during the Great Depression, where black folks are getting fired from jobs at a much higher rate than white folks. And uh, they find themselves segregated, and they're not allowed to get certain jobs, even on 125th Street. Uh, all those white-owned businesses, they allowed a lot of black folks to shop them, or they would take their money. Uh, but you couldn't work there, right? And so there is this huge dichotomy that leaves black folks vulnerable, and um, so they begin organizing in a way that uh, was unprecedented for the time in the 1930s. And one of the major events that set off this organizing was uh, the invasion of Ethiopia by Italy. Um, now, Ethiopia was the only African nation that avoided colonization. Um, in all of Africa, it is the only nation that avoided colonization, defeating Italian forces in the 19th century to prevent being colonized. And so after World War I, with the formation of the League of Nations that the United States famously was not involved in, um, but Italy was and Ethiopia was, uh, there was an agreement that if any nation in the League of Nations gets attacked, everybody defends them, right? Um, and the first time this is tested is when Italy invades Ethiopia. Now, very famously, the League of Nations does nothing. Uh, they just sit on their hands. They don't want to get involved. This is a white nation attacking a black nation. You know, most of the countries, all of the countries, this is the 1930s, um, had very deep racial prejudices uh, within their countries. I mean, they, all of the countries still do. Uh, but certainly in the 1930s, these were deep. This was just the beginning of the rise of fascism, and so you had a lot of people who um, were embracing sort of a white nationalist ideology, and so the League of Nations, they do nothing to support Ethiopia. Uh, but African Americans, they see common cause um, in the struggle of Ethiopia, right? They, this is one of the few black nations, independent black nations in the world, along with Haiti, and, and so they want to support this cause. And uh, there was actually a uh, large movement in Harlem to sign up to go defend Ethiopians. Uh, this ended up being thwarted by the Department of State in the United States, who, you know, were not allowing this to happen um, because of their own racial biases. They would allow this to happen when it was um, 
when similar events occurred in Spain uh, a few years later, but they were not going to allow this to happen in Ethiopia. Meanwhile, Ethiopia um, was getting bombarded with chemical weapons and, and just a terrible genocide was being taken place by the Italian forces in Ethiopia. And, and a few blacks were able to go there and um, uh, African-American went to Ethiopia and uh, ended up heading their air force. Uh, and this creates an opportunity for black Americans during World War II to participate in the armed forces in a way they weren't allowed to during World War I uh, because this black soldier ha had proved himself uh, during uh, the, the invasion of Ethiopia by the Italians. Um, but there's all this activism going on, so Ethiopia sort of becomes a target for it. Um, Paul Robeson is responding to it. Um, but in Harlem, you know, folks were uh, were getting frustrated by the conditions that they were facing. And, and this is a community that um, is inspired uh, to, to make real change, to, to declare their um, equality and, and have that recognized by white society. Um, in 1935, this comes to a head in Harlem. Um, white immigrants, mostly, own the shops and a lot of the buildings and all the stores on 125th Street. And, and again, while they allowed black Americans to come and purchase things, they would not allow them to work. And uh, this led initially to pickets. There were signs that held up, don't buy where you can't work. And black Harlem was outraged by the discrimination and uh, the destitution they were facing during the Great Depression. Uh, this all came to a head in 1935 when a black Puerto Rican teen was caught shoplifting and uh, a rumor spread throughout Harlem that he had been um, beat up and, and maybe even killed uh, by the white employees at the store. Um, uh, a group called the Young Liberators started a demonstration that night. Uh, someone threw a rock into a window and it unleashed a crowd that um, really decimated the white businesses on 125th Street, um, especially those that refused to employ blacks. The white police obviously responded with force, as they often do uh, up to this day. And um, in all, three blacks ended up being killed, with hundreds more arrested and injured. So a commission was appointed to try to figure out, you know, why are black folks um, burning businesses on 125th Street? The report identified injustices of discrimination in employment, the aggression of the police, and racial segregation as the conditions which led to the outbreak of rioting. Uh, even though they discovered this as the reason that the riots broke out, uh, they didn't do anything to address these issues. Uh, white business owners are getting a little anxious about where their businesses are. Um, you begin to see sort of a transition uh, on 125th Street um, to a more black-owned community. So a leader in this movement to make sure that black folks have equal rights in Harlem was a man named Adam Clayton Powell. And uh, he would be the first black councilman in New York City. He ended up being elected to the House of Representatives for the District of Harlem. He would serve in Washington. In the 1930s and 40s, uh, became a civil rights leader in, in implemented tactics like organizing of boycotts uh, with picket lines, um, trying to get blacks integrated into the community uh, in a way that would be replicated uh, by civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. in the 1950s. Um, Powell and other black leaders saw a real opportunity with the outbreak of World War II, um, where black soldiers and black factory workers were going to be needed to fight in this war effort. Right. Uh, and so many people uh, embrace the idea of the double V campaign, victory at home uh, against racism, victory abroad against the fascists. On January 16, 1941, 22,000 African Americans rallied at Madison Square Garden in support of A. Philip Randolph's demand that the federal government act to end employment discrimination. Uh, a. Philip Randolph was born in Florida, but he would move to New York City uh, during the first years of the Great Migration in 1911. And he evolved sort of a socialist ideology that valued collective action uh, to help marginalized groups, specifically African Americans. Uh, he ran for New York Secretary of State in 1922 as a socialist. Uh, he then became president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And, and Sleeping car porters, these were uh, sort of the wait staff and the, the help uh, that, that worked in trains that were the main 
means of transportation throughout the country. Uh, this was largely an African-American job and African-American male job, uh, but it was a means to a middle class for African-Americans in a way that probably no other industry offered. In 1942, Randolph uh, returned to Madison Square Garden to kick off a campaign to end discrimination in the military, in the U.S. government, and in the defense industry. This is only possible in some ways, and he would he would be victorious in all of these eventually. Um, is only possible because of World War II. Who, who were the United States fighting in World War II? They were fighting the Nazis. Uh, what do what are the Nazis all about? Uh, you often define yourself in opposition to your enemy. They're all about white supremacy, right? Protecting the Aryan race, getting rid of the the Jews and the, the unwanted groups uh, within their empire and within Europe. If you're fighting that, you, you're putting yourself in opposition to that. And African-Americans are looking around and saying, we are living in a white supremacist society. And so when black folks found out that, you know, they're they're fighting abroad to stop racism, but when they come home, they have to continue to deal with it. This led to a lot of outrage. Randolph threatened to stage a march on Washington, and the idea was it would attract hundreds of thousands of people. Um, but a week before it was scheduled to take place, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802 banning racial discrimination in war industries and government, um, setting up the Fair Employment Practices Committee, whose task it was to investigate violations and redress grievances. And so this was a big deal, right? So um, they, they took the opportunity that World War II presented, and, and men like Randolph were able to to gain real economic opportunities for African Americans. In Harlem, however, during the war, uh, you have black soldiers who are coming back who have just fought uh, against Nazi Germany, right? And uh, they are not being treated as equals, even in Harlem, right? And we're not talking about the U.S. South, where certainly Jim Crow still existed, but in Harlem, where uh, racism and racial tensions continue to exist to this day. There was another uprising in Harlem in 1943 because of these dynamics. It began when a police officer tried to arrest a woman for disorderly conduct at the Braddock Hotel. Um, a black soldier who was uh, walking through the hotel. Um, he thought this was wrong, and so he struck a police officer. Now, this black soldier was, you know, in the armed forces during World War II, and he begins to walk out of the hotel. The cop um, responds by pulling out his gun and, and shooting this soldier as he was leaving. People were outraged, right? This man was walking away, and here you have this police officer who pulls out his gun uh, and shoots uh, a man in uniform, uh, somebody who was fighting for the United States abroad, uh, fighting the existential threat of fascism and Germany, Nazi Germany. Um, people rose up uh, in Harlem. Uh, this protest spread elsewhere in the city as well. However, Harlem was the center. Um, and it led to the destruction, again, of white businesses, um, mostly along 125th Street, it left um, with the police response. Battles took place in the streets. Six ended up dying. 700 were injured and 600 were arrested. So this was a massive event. Um, after World War II, organizing in Harlem takes a dramatic shift. Organizing throughout the nation takes a dramatic shift as the rest of the country uh, begins to listen uh, to the voices of black America in a way that previously they had been ignored. 